Greetings, greetings, fellow Who Gazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the Target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. We are at book 16, the 16th book released by Target as we go in publication order, and that book is a landmark one, Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders. This is the first book to feature a regeneration. It is the first Doctor Who book out of about six so far where the Doctor dies at the end. This was published in October 1975 just as season 13 was just beginning to air on television and it was probably about a year and a half, a little bit less, after Planet of the Spiders had aired on television. From this point forward none of the books will have internal illustrations which is uh, a big loss for the series, although this is written by Terence Dix, Mr. Descriptive Powers, so perhaps the illustrations are not necessary when you look at some of the picture-painting choices that he chooses with his words. It's been a pretty eventful week in Doctor Who fandom as well, here in late February 2022. Last weekend I was in Los Angeles, recording largely from my hotel room, and now I am back in Brooklyn, and Gallifrey One is over, and I'll be back at it next year. The next convention that I'll be at will be the next Long Island Doctor Who, which is coming up probably in about nine months from now. So that's a lot of non-convention time for me going forward. But you will be hearing from some of the new friends that I made at the last galley coming up on this show in the future. So that is certainly worth looking forward to. We've had two deaths in the Doctor Who extended family, unfortunately, in the last week. The last episode that I released before this was Book 15, Doctor Who and the Green Death. And that was the story where Joe Grant leaves to marry Professor Jones. And unfortunately, a couple of days after I released the Green Death book, Stuart Bevan, who played Professor Jones, passed away. Still taken from us far too young. Stuart Bevan had been a tremendous uh, part of the Doctor Who DVD range when it came to The Green Death. He had recorded an in-character interview for the original DVD release almost 20 years ago, and then he was a big part of the Season 10 Blu-ray. He recorded a special trailer in which he and Joe Grant are still married, with grandkids saving the world. And of course, he has done the the behind-the-sofa features with Joe Grant slash Katie Manning as well, talking about all the stories from that season, and not just his own. Stuart Bevan, a very big loss. Another loss this week was Henry Lincoln, the last surviving Doctor Who TV writer from the 1960s. Let that sink in. All those amazing stories, six full years of William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton, there is now nobody left who wrote an on-screen episode for those six seasons. Henry Lincoln had written The Abominable Snowman, of which you can hear my more mixed opinion in an earlier episode of this podcast. He also wrote The Web of Fear, or co-wrote, I should say, which is coming up in a few weeks. And he also wrote The Dominators, for which his name was taken off, as well as his writing partner, Mervyn Hazeman. And The Dominators is not coming up on this show for quite some time, because we are still in the 1975 books, and that novelization came out at least a decade afterwards, give or take a couple of years. So, Stuart Bevan from the 1970s, Henry Lincoln from the 1960s, two more links with Doctor Who, now lost to us forever this past week. Coming up next, I'll be looking in depth at Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders, and then later on in the program, my interview slash discussion about Planet of the Spiders and many other topics with Graham Burke from the amazing Doctor Who podcast, Reality Bomb. Let's get to it. Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders, televised as Planet of the Spiders, written by Terrence Dix, from a teleplay by Robert Sloman and Barry Letts, screen credit to Robert Sloman. Televised May and June 1974, published in October 1975. Part 1 
of Planet of the Spiders, is one of those deceptively leisurely episodes in which seemingly nothing happens. The Doctor and Brigadier go to a dance hall to visit a series of cut-rate comedy, dance, and live magic performances. Sarah Jane chases down a story from the disgraced Captain Yates, whom she barely knows, at a Buddhist monastery about a hundred miles outside of London. The story's human villain, a tweed-clad, unemployed salesman named Lupton, is seen dabbling in the darker Buddhist arts, but he's a very low-key villain, much more low-key than the evil boss, whom Lupton's actor, John Darth, had voiced in the previous year's season finale, which we talked about here last week in episode 15, Doctor Who and the Green Death. You wouldn't expect this story to unfold in the dramatic way that it later does. Terence tells us more than once that Lupton has haggard, bitter features, which hardly puts him on par with the Daleks, the Sontarans, or the Cybermen. But to my mind, Lupton comes from a much more interesting place than those otherworldly monsters, and he proves a unique villain for the first half of the serial. For example, in the book, Lupton flashes Sarah Jane a look of supercilious inquiry that verged on a sneer. After taking a nap, Lupton surfaced angrily from a deeply refreshing sleep, filled with dreams of vast, undefined power. I've never quite had a dream like that, but few Doctor Who bad guys come from a white-collar background like this, and very few of them ever get to dream. Lupton on TV was never given a first name, and he doesn't merit one in the book either. But the Tweed Blazer and the Jack Nicholson hair that John Darth rocked on television is about all the characterization he needs, right? Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders also has no illustrations. The pictures had gone away for the novelization of Robot, which came out so soon after the TV story, and then briefly returned up to the Green Death. But now Alan Willow is gone from the line again, and no more target books from here on out will ever bear internal pictures. Of course, with Dix's sometimes lyrical writing, you don't always need drawings. Terence opens the book with a prologue, featuring a mystery couple on an expedition deep within the Amazon. And we soon learn that this couple is none other than Professor Clifford Jones and his new bride, the former Josephine Grant. Actually, no. The book opens on the back cover blurb with a truly dreadful gag, with the brigadier looking down at the regenerating doctor and saying, Well, bless my soul, who will be next, but I digress. You could look at the novelization of Planet of the Spiders as the final installment in what you could call Target's Joe Grant trilogy. While the books were published in basically random story order, here you have three releases in a row that, more by accident than design, tell Joe's entire life story. First, her TV debut in Terror of the Autons, then her TV exit in The Green Death, and then, in a bookend to The Green Death here, a return to Metabilis III, and the return of the powerful Blue Crystal, which the Doctor had taken earlier, and in the novelization only, one last time out for Joe Grant. Terence opens with one of his characteristically lush opening pan paragraphs, even more cinematic than many of his other best efforts. He writes, Night falls suddenly in the rainforests of the upper Amazon. One moment, the little clearing was bathed in greenish gloom, by the light filtering through the dense carpet of the treetops overhead. The next, it was plunged into darkness. Speaking of darkness, Terence gets to play around with the narrative a bit. This chapter is made of whole cloth, not appearing at all on TV, and he flexes his literary muscles, too. As we'll see from the next two Terence novels published immediately after this one, he's not going to have a chance to do much more muscle flexing for a little while. But here he has Cliff consider shooting his mutinous South American native porters. His business was saving lives, not destroying them, the character reflects. Plus, Terence gets one last dig in at the Welsh, after Malcolm Hulk got to spend the whole of the last book in Wales. Languages came easily to Cliff, and he was fluent in all the Indian dialects. Perhaps it was something to do with being Welsh, Joe thought. After that, all other languages must seem simple. Unfortunately, the native tribesmen don't come across too well. It is still 1975, and Terence really hasn't embraced identity politics yet, if he ever will. The head porter grunts rather than speaks, and the South American tribe was called headhunters until, quote, not too long ago. The reveal that the prologue is from Joe's POV is kept as a surprise spoiler until the last paragraph. Josephine Jones, formerly Joe Grant, one-time member of UNIT, one-time assistant to that mysterious individual known only as the Doctor, 
dropped the case on her knee and began to write. Joe doesn't appear after the prologue, but when the doctor receives her letter, late on the part one material, he reflects that, quote, neither Joe's grammar nor her handwriting had improved since she left unit. There's also a discontinuity with the Green Death novelization, because here Joe is returning the Metabilis Crystal, which Hulk never had the doctor give her in the earlier book. This is Joe's final chronological appearance in Doctor Who, until the Sarah Jane Adventures some 35 years later, excluding one late 1990s Eighth Doctor adventure, Genocide, which features a much darker and more depressed Joe Grant, which fortunately has been written out of the canon thanks to the Sarah Jane Adventures. After the story properly begins, Terence match cuts, or perhaps even better, slow dissolves Joe's outro into Mike Yates' intro. Quote, Outside, in the gardens of the big old country house, Mike Yates, formerly Captain Yates, a one-time member of Unit, one-time assistant to Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, ran through the darkness towards his car. He was more frightened than he had ever been in his life. The parallel sentence structure there, comparing Joe to Mike, is amazing, by the way. The rest of the Part 1 material is Terence firing off barbs of observational humor, which is just as entertaining as a two-fisted action plot, which uh, Part 1 certainly is not. Of a bad comedian at the dance hall, the Brigadier notes that he was, quote, talking very fast, as if afraid that the audience would make off before he could deliver his jokes. No one could blame them if they did, thought the Brigadier bitterly. Of an exotic dancing girl, quote, Fatima and her remaining veils undulated from the stage. The doctor builds, quote, one of his own inimitable lash-ups of improvised scientific equipment. That's a line you can imagine Dick saying during a Pertwee-era DVD commentary 30 years later, along with the word bouffant. Sarah wants to crown the doctor with one of his own Bunsen burners when he ignores her, and also makes a comment about researching a story on grassroots resistance to property speculators, which, as someone living in an area of Brooklyn with skyrocketing rents, Hello, Sarah Jane, please come over here and tell our story, please. Of course, there's also a little time to be portentous. Even the doctor didn't realize that his interest in Professor Clegg was to be the prelude to the most dangerous adventure of his life. Now, often that sort of line is false advertising, used to make a run-of-the-mill story sound more breathless than it is, but this is the first of only six of the 170 or so target novelizations, including the modern-day books, in which the Doctor dies on the last page, so in this case, Terence is actually quite right to say so. Clegg is written exactly as you'd expect for a character portrayed by the hapless Cyril Shapps, who portrayed a similar string of characters throughout the Troughton, Pertwee, and Tom Baker eras. Dix describes Professor Clegg's clothing as shabby and rather insignificant, but tells us the professor, who's not really a professor at all, did his best to put a good face on things. After the doctor reveals that he knows about both Clegg's secrets, which are forged academic credentials and true ESP powers, the professor seems to deflate like a punctured balloon. The book adds in an explanation for Clegg's death, fright-induced heart failure, which was never provided on TV. The book, as you've probably gathered so far, is pretty radically restructured from the TV serial, with several sequences invented or rearranged. As I've talked about in many of the previous novelizations from this era, the mid-1970s books were written from rehearsal, or scripts, earlier scripts, rather than the final televised product. There are many books that contain more scenes, and more and often better dialogue, than their TV counterparts. This is one of them although not quite as radical a departure as Doctor Who and the Green Death had been last week. One loss is that Harry Sullivan is not mentioned by name. Here, the book uses the original name of Unit's off-screen medic, Dr. Sweetman, a name which Nicholas Courtney changed during recording in recognition of Harry joining the regular cast in Robot, which was filmed concurrently to Planet of the Spiders. As Robot had already been novelized, and Harry Sullivan has already been in a Target book, it seems that Dix just plain forgot to change the line when transcribing out the earlier scripts. Another big change is that Choji gets an additional scene in the Part 2 material, which was removed before filming, warning Captain Yates not to get involved with investigating Lupton's evil doing. On the surface, Choji should be the TV story's weak link, as in The Abominable Snowman six years earlier. He's an Asian character, played by a Western actor in stilted makeup and speaking entirely in fortune cookie slogans. 
When reading the print version of all the Buddhist riddles and Zen koans, one senses Terence Dix rolling a world-weary eye at all the philosophies that Barry Letts, a Buddhist himself, would have brought to the production office. Choji is described with an ivory-colored face, which broke into a thousand tiny smiling wrinkles, and he speaks in a clipped yet sing-song voice, end quote. Later on, he giggles disconcertingly. Terence also seems to get in some barbs at Letts' leanings, observing an added dialogue, when Choji talks about the fullness of the void or the emptiness of the 10,000 things, that Sarah hadn't understood a word of it. To which Choji gigglingly replies, quite right, the Dharma that can be spoken is no true Dharma. But of course, at the end of the story, you learn, Lost Horizon style, that Choji is not a Buddhist or Asian, or in this case, even a human at all. So he comes across much better in print than all those one-dimensional monks from The Abominable Snowman that Terence had written for a few books earlier. The Doctor senses that something is lurking beneath Choji's placid surface, as the two men debate during the Part 3 material. Quote, Each of the two men was calm, polite, and utterly determined. Under the unassuming exterior of the little monk, the Doctor could feel an intelligence and will that was a match for his own. Tommy the mentally challenged young man, who serves as building porter at the monastery, is also described in terms that veer between sentimental and patronizing. Quote, Tommy was a hulking, slow-witted youth, usually described as simple by his fellow villagers. He had worked at the monastery ever since it opened. Tommy was fiercely devoted to Joji and his fellow monks, perhaps because they treated him with exactly the same quiet courtesy that they extended to everyone else. Sarah also notes, quote, for all his size and obvious strength, his round blue eyes held the simple curiosity of a child. All this material about Tommy will pay off much later in the book. In the Part 2 material, the spiders appear, and use Lupton as a vehicle for retrieving the Doctor's stolen Metabilis crystal. They promise Lupton earthly riches, of course, never intending to deliver. Dix cleverly describes the voices. Quote, then the spider spoke to him, not out loud, of course, but inside his head. Her voice, somehow Lupton knew the creature was female, was clear, sweet, and icily evil. The book uses a 12-chapter structure, which doesn't quite adhere rigidly to a six-part format. Most cliffhangers come at the end of the even-numbered chapters, with an exception or two, but you can sense Dick's stretching to force the material into this format. Chapter 3, for example, ends on a false moment of peril, with Lupton's spider warning him that he might have to kill the doctor, a moment not included in the TV broadcast. The much derided chase scene, which takes up the back half of part two on TV, is reproduced, at least for my money, pretty faithfully in the book, stay tuned for a counterpoint, with the doctor getting internal thoughts to help narrate for us exactly why the doctor changes vehicle every few minutes. This is also the only target book to feature John Pertwee's flying car, the Hoomobile, as Malcolm Hulk gleefully excised that vehicle's only other appearance when he novelized Invasion of the Dinosaurs a few books later. Dick seems to enjoy riding the chase. He slips into the head of a police officer, who gets to describe Sarah as, quote, a trendy-looking bird. The doctor borrows some flying tactics from the Red Baron, and of course, he writes, quote, The brigadier had placated angry prime ministers in his time, but an English policeman in hot pursuit of a motor ring offense was beyond his powers. I'm going to assume that line is based on some real-life experience that Terrence had, trying to talk his way out of a speeding ticket. After the break, Dix transports us away from Earth at the end of Chapter 5, and most of the last four parts of the story will occur away from Earth, away from our planet of the Buddhists. The spiders are coming, and so are some of the worst acted and directed humans in the history of Doctor Who. Fortunately, Terence will prove superior to the material he was given to adapt, and the final seven chapters of the novelization are going to be far more interesting than what we got on television. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry, Doctor. What have you got to be sorry about? You did very well. You should be proud of yourself. To let that creature take me over like that. I mean, I actually volunteered. We are all apt to surrender ourselves to domination, even the strongest of us. Do you mean me? Not all spiders sit on the back. Oh, I don't understand. 
You're not saying they've taken over the doctor, are you? Oh, no, Sarah, no. No, he's talking about my greed. Greed? You? Oh. Yes, my greed for knowledge. For information. He's saying that all this is basically my fault. If I hadn't taken the crystal in the first place... It... I know who you are now. You were always a little slow in the uptake, my boy. It's been a long, long time. You know each other? Oh, yes. Yes, he was my teacher. My... My guru, if you like. In another time, another place. Another life. Oh, no. Don't tell me you're a Time Lord, too. I am. But the discipline they serve was not for me. No, nor for me. I wouldn't have chosen your alternative. To borrow a TARDIS was a little naughty, to say the least. The realization of Metabilis 3 on TV is not great, Bob, to quote a very famous and funny line from Mad Men. But Terence, in the book, is freed from the constraints of too early CGI circa 1974 with overly bright studio lights and bad acting. Our first glimpse of Metabilis in the book, when Sarah arrives in Chapter 6, it teases all the senses. It feels dry and hot, and Sarah can feel sand and pebbles underfoot. The air smells of, quote, a sort of richness, a not unpleasant spicy tang. She can see yellow sandstone and, quote, unquote, fantastically shaped boulders with towering blue mountains, the desert was strewn with a carpet of many-colored shining gemstones. Terence can set a scene. This is what we were all hoping to see on TV, but didn't. The villagers live in a patch of green cultivated fields edging a sparkling river. Crank out the 70mm film for this one, right? When Lupton arrives a chapter or two later, his meal menu includes the taste of fiery blue wine, chunks of roasted mutton, rough hold round bread, and strange exotic fruits. Excuse me, I'm kind of starving right now. That actually sounds really good. Terence has the magical ability to explain away a plot hole with a sarcastic aside. After Sarah is rescued from death by the angry villagers, she observes that it, quote, seemed odd to be exchanging introductions with people who seconds ago had been planning to kill her. The detail extends to the Spider Queen, who in the book is named Huath, H-U-A-T-H, which sounds just realistic enough to avoid silly space name syndrome, and anyone who read Christopher Bulis's Doctor Who novels and the Virgin and BBC lines know of what I speak. The episode 3 cliffhanger is spruced up for the book. Sarah laments at the end of chapter 6, O oh, Doctor, of all the times to arrive. A line that I can hear Liz Slayton recite so perfectly on TV in my head that, as a victim of the Mandela effect, I'm always kind of stunned whenever I watch the story that the light is not there. The Queen discovers Sarah by sensing her angry and defiant thought waves, an upgrade over the TV where the Queen just saw her through a doorway. When the Doctor bows down before the Queen, it's, quote, an elaborate style he'd learned at the court of the good Queen Bess, the classic Dick's historical figure aside, that you have to wonder if it influenced Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat who had their own little Tenth Doctor slash Queen Best story arc planned about 35 to 40 years later. And the Part 3 cliffhanger comes, unusually for Terence in mid-chapter, when the Doctor is blasted by the Queen's crackling finger of flame, rather than on TV by the somewhat less telegenic Walter Randall. And remember how wooden and flat the Metabilis villagers were on TV? Terence didn't get the memo, as the Doctor lays presumably dying from the Queen's blast in the episode 4 material, Rigo looks on with, quote, the calmness of one well used to death and suffering. As he usually does, Terence can summarize each one-dimension guest character with a perfect sentence, and it's Sarah who observes that, quote, the younger and more hot-headed Tuar was urging open revolt, while Arik insisted that this would be mere suicide. One of the few mistakes Terence makes is having Sarah take off her shoes in Chapter 7, and she doesn't reclaim them before she gets arrested, meaning that she's barefoot for the rest of the Metabilis chapters. Unless there was a Manolo Blahnik outpost on Metabilis 3, hope stepping on that carpet of many-colored shining gemstones didn't hurt her too much. Better is the added moment of tension 
as Arak retrieves the Doctor's strange machine, which involves Arak outwitting a patrol of guards. That's an extra bit of dashing and daring that we didn't get on television. Quote, Dawn was approaching on Metabilis Three, The planet's huge, bright sun, far closer to Metabilis than our sun is to Earth, was rising rapidly. The gemstones of the desert reflected its rays in a hundred different colors. In the village, the humans stirred uneasily, knowing that it would soon be time to go and toil in the fields for their spider rulers. Listen to that crystal clear prose. Tickles the senses, teases the mind, and yet hardly any words longer than three syllables and not a single run-on sentence. Later on, the jeweled desert stretched away to the distant blue mountains, too. Of course, while the doctor is busy taking charge in the village, the novelization cuts out some parallel history lessons between Sabor and Sarah Jane. Sabor, dad to Arik and Tuar, has more to do on screen. But Terence uses the void to do some subtle world-building, giving Arak a resistance organization and runners, and telling us that Metabilis III has other human villages, too. When Arak kills the guard captain, oh, that Walter Randall, the doctor sadly accepts the death, quote, as always, Terence writes, the taking of life saddened and sickened him. Another trademark Terence line comes in Chapter 9, when the doctor, as he always does, tries to give orders to his arresting guards. For a moment, Terence writes, the captain was so astonished at his audacity that he almost let the doctor go. I don't care how many target books that line appears in, probably at least 25% if not more. Guess me every time. As Terence writes for the spiders, he gives us in the episode 5 material a wonderfully gruesome detail, not made explicit on TV. Quote, the queen was silent. Pressing her advantage, the spider went on. This is not the first mistake the queen has made. Maybe she is growing old. Maybe it is time for a coronation. Since the main feature of a spider coronation is the ceremonial eating of the old queen by her successor, the spider queen reacted violently to this suggestion. She sought desperately for some move that would restore her power. End quote. For the second straight Sarah Jane book, and there have been two now, Sarah faints in print, where she didn't on TV. Here, fainting from pain in Chapter 9 when she's released from her spider cocoon. Of course, in the book, the cocoon was dangling from the ceiling, whereas on TV, it was just a comfortable lie-down on top of a table, with the cocoon presumably affording mattress-like padding of reasonable comfort. Something else missing is Sarah's negotiation with the Spider Queen. On TV, before allowing herself to be possessed, she negotiated for the release of the two-legged slaves. In the book, unfortunately, that material is excised, taking away a little bit of Sarah Jane's agency, but giving her fainting in return. Of course, for all the add-ons, details of the spider's dietary habits, Sarah's fainting habit, it's what's taken away from the book that's more remarkable. Jenny Laird's unfortunately delivered speech in episode 5 about raising Eric at her breast and having to mourn all alone, just not here. When the Doctor encounters the Great One in episode 5, Terence describes her voice in a way that would do Maureen Morris proud, high-pitched and edgy, like chalk squeaking on a slate. This isn't quite how she sounded on TV, but later on, in the final chapter, Terence writes her lines in all capital letters, which really does get to the point. The Great One's mind control of the Doctor, a shocking moment on TV, when was John Pertwee ever bested by an adversary before, is missing in the book. That's a big loss. It is somewhat made up for by the Doctor's observation. Quote, whatever powers, whatever towering intelligence the Great One had attained, the price had been too high. The Great One was mad. Another big change in the book, and I don't think Terence would ever quite do this again, at least not for a very long time, is a massive restructuring of the scenes, kind of like what John Blum talked about when he was here discussing the abominable snowmen with us. Episode 4 on TV had a lot of material set back on Earth, with Tommy's transformation, Yates negotiating with Barnes. All that is taken out of the corresponding novelization material, which has several chapters run straight through on Metabilis with no intercutting. Instead, it's relocated to the Episode 5 material in the book, starting in Chapter 10, which is called Return to Earth. Quote, Tommy spent the rest of the day crouched in his tiny cupboard, studying the blue crystal and wondering what to do with it. The little glowing fires in the crystal seemed to soothe him, then they almost seemed to talk to him, telling him that there were things he had to do. But what things? 
he rummaged in his box of treasures and produced a tatty child's primer, a relic of the days before people had given up trying to teach him anything. He'd hung on to it, in the vain hope that one day the mysterious black squiggles called letters would unlock their secrets. Now, with the blue crystal shining beside him, he tried again. Terence, as much as he celebrates Tommy's mental enhancements, though again, listen later on for a counterpoint, gets as much fun digging in at Lupton's less intelligent partners in crime back on Earth. Talk about advertising, Yates thinks. They were the most inept bunch of conspirators he had ever tackled. End quote. Terence also doesn't make much of an effort to characterize the other members of Lupton's crew beyond Barnes, of Moss, and Kiever and Land, and if you can tell them apart on TV, boy, you're some fan. We learn, for example, that Kiever is only taciturn, though we do learn that when they blast energy from their fingertips, their opponents are flung to one side like thistledown. <laughs> thistledown. Here I am, 48 years old, and I'm still looking up definitions of some of the words in target books. Isn't that neat? More descriptively, Terence also uses his trademark adjective pairs to soften Choji's oblique explanation for not being surprised at Tommy's changes. When everything is new, how can anything be a surprise? Tommy is, quote, baffled, but somehow reassured, close quote, at this pointed non-answer. Another big structural change is the episode 5 cliffhanger, a furious bit of post-production editing on TV. The first part of Planet of the Spiders that I ever saw on TV, thinking about it, would have been episode 6, which my PBS station, Channel 21 on Long Island, aired out of sequence, one night only, airing all the regeneration stories they had the license for, from War Games episode 10 up through Twin Dilemma part 1, all on the same night, during pledge drive season, I don't have to tell you. When I watched the episode 6 of Planet of the Spiders in isolation, I had no way of telling where the episode 5 cliffhanger would have been. The actual moment, the attack on Tommy outside Kanpo's door, is kicked deep into the text of chapter 11, finally appearing on page 108, when the book ends on page 122. Although when the Doctor and Kanpo finally meet, here in chapter 11, Terence has them, quote, dropping instinctively into Tibetan, although of course not going so far as to use actual Tibetan words, he'd handle this somewhat differently years later for the Mind of Evil book. If you're wondering if the Doctor is going to rub his chin in this book, he does, in Chapter 11, on page 104. Another line Terence uses here that you'll see again years later, in State of Decay, is Kanpo, producing a newly learned colloquialism with evident pride. That's in Chapter 12. Another detail not made quite clear in the book. On TV, we learn that Kanpo saw the spider on Sarah's back all the time during their Episode 6 meeting and by taking the doctor's hand, the doctor can see the spider through Kanpo's eyes. This is removed for the book, or maybe it was added in the studio at the last minute, where the doctor doesn't see the spider until it literally materializes on her back in public. A larger disappointment, and you'll hear more about this during my interview, is that Kanpo's identification of the doctor's greed for knowledge, for information, his theft of the great crystal, is what sets the story's deadly events into motion to begin with. The interview with Kanpo in Chapter 11 is greatly truncated, as will be the Third Doctor's death scene, by the omission of that revelation. When the Doctor returns to Metabilis in Chapter 12, we're given a better explanation for how the spiders managed to enslave Arak and Tuar. Here, in the heart of the mountain, close to the Cave of Crystal, the protection you gave them, the spider says to the Doctor, was weakened. These two were rash. They ventured too far, and we captured their minds. Lupton's death, in episode 6 on TV, always seemed a bit cursory to me. Granted, this is a slim book, only 115 pages of text, and that's covering a lot of TV material. But you can find the great two sentences that speak more volumes than three pages of internal POV might have done. Quote, Lupton should have seen that his usefulness, never very great, was now over. His life hung by a thread as fine as a spider's web. Lost to all sense of preservation, he ranted on. Lupton's death serves one last purpose in the book, in a way you won't see on television. The Queen spoke. This two legs can do us a last service, my sisters. Let us feast on our favorite food once more before the end. The Spider Council began to close in on Lupton's body. Terence doesn't quite take the opportunity to narrate the Doctor's death from his own POV. 
not like he'll do in Caves of Androzani in another ten years. But the great one, the doctor observes, is, quote, the last wonder he would ever see, which, if you savor those seven words for a minute, is an astonishing capstone to the Pertwee era with its 700 wonders of the universe. I got chills reading that, anyway. And, quote, even in such an extreme situation, the doctor's scientific curiosity was still strong. It had been a dominant characteristic all his life, and it did not abandon him at the end. The Great One dies in a torrent, as I said earlier, of all capital letters. Terence isn't quite clear why the Great One's death also kills off all the other spiders. He just says, quote, their minds linked in some mystic way to hers, close quote, which you can sense him sitting at his desk, rolling his eyes at another plot contrivance. But the villagers who didn't emote on TV, at least at the book had to observe, tomorrow would indeed be a new dawn for Metabilis III, the dawn of freedom. The regeneration, when it happens, comes quick, a three-page add-on. Terence uses the time to clear up missing plot threads. Nicholas Courtney, busy filming Robot at the same time, was only in the first production block of Spiders and never made it to the monastery. Here, the brigadier recalls an apocryphal visit and flashback. There was also some story about the abbot disappearing, but since no one seemed very sure if he'd ever been there in the first place, the brigadier proposed to let that one strictly alone. <laughs> LOL. And the brigadier uses his influence to get Tommy admitted to university. See the 1996 new adventure Happy Endings for one possible theory as to where Tommy ended up, by the way. When the doctor dies, it's the first time that's happened in a target novelization. And the brigadier, fittingly, for a story set partly in a Buddhist monastery and written by the TV authors with Buddhist principles in mind, gets in a near religious observance at the end. Brigadier, look, said Sarah. It's starting. A golden glow was appearing around the doctor's body. Even as they watched, the features began to blur and change. Well, bless my soul, said the brigadier. Here we go again. Of course, the third doctor's not really dead. He appears in two of the next three novelizations released after this one, before the line shifts to the new Tom Baker era. But Terence adapts this doctor's final TV story with considerable poetry and drama and wicked detail. It's a short book, but Terence puts a lot of thought into cleaning up the structure and some of the plot holes. And as his books will start to come faster and faster, when he's writing eight a year rather than just two or three, we won't see the like of Planet of the Spiders again for some considerable time to come. Coming up next, my interview with Graham Burke. He knew if he went back there he would destroy himself. We'll never see him again. Doctor, why did you have to go back? I had to face my, my fear, Sarah. I had to face my fear. That was, was more important than us going on living. Please, don't die. A tear? Sarah Jane? No. no, don't cry. While this life is... And we're back, and I'm happy to welcome my next guest to Doctor Who Literature. You may have read his nonfiction books, you may have seen him speak, you may have heard his incredible podcast, Reality Bomb. My next guest combines the attributes of three of my favorite podcasters. He has the interview prowess of Terry Gross. He has the intensity of Dan Carlin. And his writing has the seductive erudition of Karina Longworth. So join us, won't you, as we welcome Graham Burke to Doctor Who Literature. Graham, welcome to the program. 
Well, thank you. That's a, that's quite a build up. I'm hope I can even live up to a tenth of that. I'm just happy you've come down market for the next hour. I, 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 well, it's always a delight to be with you. I mean, your your erudition about Doctor Who is uh, knows no boundaries, and uh, and I have been a tremendous fan of yours for years. So, you and I have known each other since the Rec Arts Doctor Who days of the early to mid 1990s, when Rec Arts was still the wild west of Doctor Who fandom, and we have traded many thousands of words sometimes civilly about uh, different doctor who stories over the years <laughs> very occasionally <laughs> but one of the few things that you and i have never talked about at length is the novelization so when i was drawing up my guest list for the early episodes of this podcast i wanted to sign you down for an open slot as early as i could and the first book that you and i agreed upon was planet of the spiders so mm. Before we talk about that, I want to just go back and explore the origins of your fandom a little bit. This is uh, your first time on the show of hopefully many more appearances. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just figure out how and when you became a fan. So I know you grew up in Canada. How, what was your first exposure to Doctor Who? How old were you? Where did you see it? Well, my first exposure was probably when I was about, um, um, it was then when I was seven. It was... Uh, Doctor Who started on uh, on Canadian television in the mid seventies, um, so it, it was shown sort of once a week on uh, on the public television station in Canada. Uh, I I watched several Pertwee episodes, uh, not all together, but you know I, I, I so I saw snippets. Uh, Planet of Spiders was actually one of them. I I, I have I, uh, but I really didn't become a fan of Doctor Who until nineteen eighty four uh, when I was about fourteen years old. Uh, it was May 1984. Uh, the episode was Pyramids of Mars, episode two. Uh, and I was homesick uh, and I was kind of lethargic. And my sister had just finished watching 321 Contact, uh, as, as you do in the 1970s. And uh, she got up and left, and, and I was, and I didn't feel like changing the channel. And uh, I watched uh, Doctor Who instead of One Day at a Time. And the rest is history, basically. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life. So. <laughs> uh, and I got and the target novels happened very shortly thereafter. I, I the first one I'd read was uh, well, my friend, best friend Rob was hugely into Doctor Who. The whole reason why I started, I watched this, you know, show that he liked because was was because it, it was a show that he liked, and it had time travel, which I love as a concept, and and it had and it was British, which I love because I love Monty Python and I loved. Hitchhiker's Guide and all kinds of things. So I watched. So I I immediately raided his Target novel collection, and the first one I ever read was Doctor Who and the Daleks, and then I read the Three Doctors, um, and they were both from his collection. So I, and and the first and much later down the line, and we'll get to this is uh, is uh, Planet of the Spiders, which I read around uh, I think around uh, November 1984. Uh, again, I stole his copy uh, that he kept in his bedroom. So yeah. I'm just curious if you had gotten a little more into three, two, one contact, your primary phantom could have been the bloodhound gang rather than Dr. Who. <laughs> I was a little too old for it. To be honest, I think the re my sister had left the room actually a lot sooner, a lot very early into three, two, one contact, but I had a crush on the redhead. So I kept it on for that reason. So yeah, I probably could have been a fan for that reason for sure. So the very first novelization that you read would have been Doctor Who in An Exciting Adventure with the Daleks. Now, this is 1984. This is probably before Hartnell starts coming mm -hmm. over to North America. I know that I saw a Hartnell episode for the first time at my very first convention in Manhattan in the summer of 1985. They showed a movie version of Dalek Invasion of Earth. And I'm just curious, if you're reading a Hartnell novelization in 1984, did that confuse you? Did it grab you? Did you know who the characters were? Did it throw you off that it was written entirely in the first person? I understood it actually quite well. I mean, I, I mean, I understood the Doctor Who lore. I mean, th that was the great thing of it becoming a fan was that you know, I fell hard for it and I wanted to learn everything about it and I and I got my hands on anything I could and so yeah, I was quite excited to read it. I have to say, I remember. I remember looking through, We I remember not long after reading it, I was uh, with my friend Rob in Toronto, where we were at Baca, which is a, uh, 
which is a much loved science fiction bookstore in Toronto. And, and, uh, I, and I was there and we were looking at, uh, Doctor Who, a celebration, which was, you know, one of the first coffee table books ever done about Doctor Who. It was much too expensive for a 14 year old to buy, but I was thumbing through it. Uh, with Rob, and we saw the pages where they were doing screen grabs from the original pilot version of An Unearthly Child. And I remember pointing out a couple of the pictures with Rob and saying, oh, that must be the scenes where they meet on Barnes Common. Because, <laughs> because, I, thought, because I thought for sure, you know, this was a straight up adaptation of the very first Doctor Who story. And uh, and shortly after that, I think I got a program guide, the program guide from uh, John Mark Lefissier. And then I realized, oh, no, actually, there was a whole story in the Stone Age. This is actually takes liberties. But, you know, I, I really I really love the I love the first one. I, I mean, I would have I, I, I would have absolutely have adored Ben being on your being on your first episode doing that one, because I really I really love that. I really love Whitaker's novelization. I think he's a wonderful writer. I think his I think he, the way he takes from uh, a lot of different sources and, and builds it, it's very reminiscent of Out of the Silent Planet, which is one of my very favorite science fiction novels, C.S. Lewis's book. So it, it had a lot of wonderful elements to it. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I was never taken aback by it, but I did read a lot of Doctor Who books before I'd actually seen those doctors properly like you know my only glimpse of patrick Troughton was what i dimly remembered from the watching the three doctors as a five as a five or six year old and and my uh and and looking at uh and uh looking at him in jason and the argonauts where he plays a very very different role to the second doctor <laughs> so <laughs> yes i remember being home sick from school in the first grade this is probably 1979 or 1980 and I was named after Jason from Jason and the Argonauts. My parents both being New York City school teachers in the early 70s. It's what you did. Oh. So they told me very excitedly that the movie after which I was named was airing on TV in the afternoon. So I vividly remember Patrick Troughton's one scene because it terrified me to bits. Yeah. And I was also feeling a little bit sick. So I went to lie down on the bed and hide under the blankets. And I fell asleep and missed the end of the movie. <laughs> And I didn't watch Jason and the Argonauts again, probably for another 30 years when the Blu-ray came out. Rob had it on on uh, Betamax. Uh, Rob's father had a Betamax player, and so he so he had it. And Rob, Rob loved those kinds of those kinds of mo- You know, he he loved Amicus. He loved Hammer. He loved all those all, all those sorts of. Uh, and, and, he, and lots of lots of movies like that. And I think he's big on the. Uh, what was the other one? At the Earth's Core was another one that he absolutely loved. So I watched, uh, so yeah, I remember seeing the Patrick Troughton scene and Patrick Troughton, I remember being shocked at how low Patrick voice, Troughton's voice was because the when I read The Second Doctor, I, I pictured him having a much higher register, which is actually what he does, employs when he plays the Doctor. But, you know, so he was like, you know, but so it was it was this shock to discover that actually Patrick Troughton is an amazing uh, character actor who has tremendous depth, breadth, and uh, yeah, he was just playing. He was just playing the role of Jason the Argonauts, very, like he would, as opposed to how he played the Second Doctor. There are a couple of comedic groans that he does in Jason and the Argonauts, which sound a little bit like season six Patrick Troughton. But you're right; otherwise, it's an entirely different performance. Yeah. And speaking of childhood memories, I've told the story on the podcast before. Now, I didn't start having guests until episode five slash book five, which was Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, when I was joined by your co-author, Stacy Smith. But I'll, I told the story in the very first episode. When I first bought Doctor Who and the Daleks, and this is the 1980s reprint with the 1970s logo on the cover, oh, man. I bought it in the bookstore, was very excited. We were still in the mall having lunch, and I started reading the book, and I didn't recognize anything at all that happened in the first two chapters. And I don't know if I had already seen Daleks on PBS at that point, or if I just knew that this wasn't how the story went. And I just thought, this is not for me. And I actually, hold on to your hats, I actually returned the book, (laughs) and I got a different book instead. And I actually handed it back to the cashier who was still at the register and said, this isn't for me, and I bought another one. And a couple of years later, I finally went back and I bought it for real and I engaged with it. I was a little bit older and a little more mature, but that's probably my worst, most embarrassing Doctor Who story. Returning the novelization of Doctor Who and the Daleks because it wasn't the way it appeared on television. That is very, very on brand for you, Jason, I have to say. Um, (laughs) That is peak Jason. Complete, completely unexpected. I've only ever returned one book in my life. 
and it was War of the Daleks by John Peel. And 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 I remember at the time I gave it back. I, I actually bought the book. I, I was living in Britain at the time, and I was taking the Docklands Light Railway home. It was like two stops from Canary Wharf, where the where the bookstore was. Picked up the book, started reading it. Said got back on the dock on the right railway, came all the way back to Canary Wharf, walked back in and said, yeah, I want to return this. And, and, and they said, they said, why? I said, because it's a terrible book. And, and they said, that's fine. So I, I bought the book of lists by Justin Richards instead, but yes, uh, which is not very good either, but uh, it was a load better than that. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been, I've been very friendly. I've been occasionally, I've seen John Peel at conventions and occasionally been friendly with him. He seems like a very nice chap, but I'm sorry, that was a terrible book. So, you know, John sat down for an interview with me when I was doing my new adventures documentary. Uh, you were in the same episode actually That's for right. Trap That's One. Right. And then John and I were just on a panel together at uh, Gallifrey, Gallifrey One in L.A. this past weekend. We were both on a panel about the new adventures. He was one of the celebrity guests, and I was one of the seldom heard from panelists sitting all the way down at the end of the table. (laughs) I want to say that I joined the 8th Doctor Adventures group on Facebook, and they've been Mm -hmm. engaged in a group reread of the EDAs. Now, I ejected somewhere early in the 1998 books because... The line was not nearly as good as I remembered it when I was in my 20s. But when I read War of the Daleks this time around, it was a thousand times better than I remember it being. And I'm not just saying that because I want John to appear on the show. But the action-adventure <laughs> sequences are written from the high technical skill. And the continuity references are actually a lot of fun. The interludes with the Draconians are much yeah. better than I remembered. And yes, the Doctor and Sam Jones are maybe not the best Doctor and companion duo but that's certainly not john peel's fault he was just giving the guidelines that he was uh, written and when the end of the book ties into the beginning of power of the daleks maybe you could say he's taking the love of continuity a little too far but again that's not the only eighth doctor adventure to, to commit that sin so if you want to try that again it's actually i think a lot better than you recall i think i did end up buying it in the end but i have to say on the whole the Eighth Doctor range is a gigantic disappointment to me, to the point where I was recently, uh, as you can see, Jason, behind me, or you can see my Doctor Who shelf. Um, so there, so that is my giant shelf of Target novels and uh, my new Adventures novels. And I was unpa- I, I, I moved to this place a couple of years ago, and I finally was unpacking like a year ago. And I un- open, open, I open, I had the box marked Doctor Who books, and I was like, "Oh, great! Can't get out the wait to get out the Target novels. This is so great." Opened it up, and it was my box of Eighth Doctor Adventures, and I went, "Oh, damn!" And and <laughs> and and that, and that was my sign. That was my Marie Kondo moment where I just said, "This is nuts. This sparks the exact opposite of joy for me." And I immediately went on Twitter and said, "If anyone wants any EDAs, I am giving away my collection, except for a few select books." And uh, and uh, and I gave away a bunch of books to a bunch of people who who were desperate to plug holes in their collection. I was happy to help them. And uh, yeah, I because I just suddenly re- I I. I I remember reading those books, and and after a while, it was just one of those exercises in realizing, Daddy's never coming home again, and <laughs> and, and you know, like you had like you know, five glorious years of prose that was you know people trying to push the boundaries, doing interesting things, and then you just, and then you had like a bunch of years where they were doing kind of doing bland vanilla books, and then they said, oh wait, we can we can we can start doing really unbelievably you know profound books and the the capital p profound books were were just basically i don't know it was just kind of like stuff that wouldn't wouldn't would have gotten a d in a in a in a in a university creative writing class you know it, it was someone who had just huffed an awful uh, you know you know just basically you know took a bunch of, took a bu- took a bunch of Philip K Dick huffed it and thought oh yeah I can, I, I can I can I can I can I, I can I can write profound stuff with, and and thus fa- faction paradox is born and and everyone then tried to you know outdo each other and and they never but you never ever got another like you know with the version range I always thought like once a year you were going to get like a set piece or you're going to get a damaged goods or you were going to get you know once a year there was always this unbelievably good this is so good prose I uh, this is this belongs in a Booker Prize novel kind of kind of level of fiction and 
and you just got very ordinary books. And then, and then the Justin Richards era happened and it was, and, and it just got duller and duller and duller. And I just went, so yeah, so that was my rant about the EDAs. I did not think you were going to get that out of me today, Jason, but there you go. I'll just say you cannot be profound on purpose. Either you have it in you or you don't. And if somebody yeah. who's not profound is trying to be profound, you wind up with the ancestor cell. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh my God. That was such a terrible book. That was one of the first books I was like, okay, I can't wait for that to go to the charity shop. Yeah, I, I it was it was there was a lot of books like that. Like, and I just kind of got very tired of it. And and there are a few good standouts. I still think the Blue Angel is a very good book. I think Alien, I think I think Alien Bodies is amazing, um, to give Lawrence Miles his due. I think there uh, I think uh I think there's I think there's some really kind of uh, you know, decent books in 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 the range, but I also think you know, um, I really love Casualties of War. I, I remember, but oh, yes. a lot. Um, but uh, I and I remember for years I championed the Face Eater, and then I reread it and I went, "What are you thinking, Graham?" So I don't know. It, it's 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 there's there's a lot of good stuff, but honestly, uh, on the whole, I just I I found it was it's it's a it's a range that meets expectations most of the time and rather than and rather than and i'd been used to a range of doctor who that exceeded expectations see the face eaters came along at exactly the right time because it was a straightforward police procedural there was a character who was clearly cast as linda hunt and yep. coming in the middle of a lot of overly profound overly drawn out books that just told a story got in and got out and it might not work out of sequence but coming when it did i enjoyed it a lot more than the books that came before or after and that, that, that's exactly what happened to me i loved it because it was just finally just a straight ahead doctor who story it was great um when you reread it out of sequence you kind of go oh this is kind of weak you know um everything wrong everything stacy smith told me about this book is absolutely right um but you know sorry stacy <laughs> the book that I hated the most out of the early EDAs was Longest Day by an author named Mike Collier. It was nasty, brutish, and long. And what I didn't know until a couple of months ago was that Mike Collier doesn't exist. No, you didn't know that it was Stephen Cole, yeah. I yeah. did not. Surprisingly, considering that I was at the epicenter of rec arts at the time, I didn't find that out until a year beginning with uh, 2020. <laughs> Yeah, those those are it's uh, that it, that is not a particularly nice novel either. Like, there's just lots of really really terribly terrible novels in that in that in that range, and you just kind of go, yeah, I miss I, I I just you know I loved the I loved the NAs the NAs were my the NAs were my jam, and the NAs came at the right time of my life. The NAs came just as I was in university. You know, it was just you know. It was nice to read Doctor Who that was fun, that seemed grown up, and it was just, and, but it was also just, Virgin had this kind of standard that says, go nuts with the pros, we don't care, and it's like, okay, um, you know, I think some of Russell's writing in, in Damaged Goods is some of the best writing I've ever read, period. I think it's a fantastic novel, ir irrespective of the Doctor Who in it. What's funny is that when I had Ross from Gallifrey's Most Wanted on here a few episodes ago, he was coming from the exact opposite place as you and me. <laughs> you and I love the new adventures. We were fortunate enough to get our name in a couple of new adventures, and we were there. We were hanging out with the authors on Rec Arts. We knew where they were coming from. Ross wasn't reading Doctor Who during the NA's years. He came in with the EDAs. He's a few years older than us. And for him, the EDAs are where the books are at, which is quite the opposite of us. So at some point... I may try and get the two of you in the same virtual podcast room to do a battle oh, royale. Oh God, but in, in case you're joining us, this is uh, Graham Burke and Jason talking about the We Hate the EDAs Hour. <laughs> let's take a brief uh, change of format and oh, let's sure. go off the boards. And instead of talking about how much we hate the EDAs, let's talk a little bit about Terrence Dix, who, by the way, wrote the first and much derided EDA, The Eight Doctors. But that is yes. a story for another day, to misquote Paul Harvey. Indeed. So my first Terrence Dix was Invasion of Time. And I don't know if you remember your first Terrence Dix, but it's certainly a life-changing moment for any fan. I think his first Terrence Dix. Do you recall yours? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, quite, I, I, quite vividly. It was, uh, it was The Three Doctors, uh, which, I, which I stole, which I borrowed from. I stole. I, I gave it back to him. I, I borrowed from Rob Jones uh, for several months, and I loved it. I mean, I, I, it's very straight-ahead writing. I love, I love, you know, Doctor Two, Doctor, Doc, the Doctor, Doctor Two. I thought I thought that was really fun. It, it was a, it's a great it's a great novelization. And uh, I remember the first one I bought was uh, Arc of Infinity, 
which uh, is an odd choice, I know, but I bought it because I was a massive continuity uh, ho, and I wanted and I wanted to read the, the the Omega coming back, which I which at the time I thought was Omega because I hadn't actually seen Arc of Infinity on television, <laughs> and so and I remember I remember it vividly. It's a very it's a mut, it's a very engaging novel. I always love Terrence's prose style. It's a very it's a very it's very kind of um, it's very sparse and but very yeah, evocative. I think the next one I bought of his was the Five Doctors, and I still think it was a place of ancient evil. It is the finest opening line of of, of a Doctor Who book ever. Um, it's just so evocative and so small, but so perfect. So you always know where you stand with Terrence Dix because when he likes the story that he's adapting, you can tell. Yeah. And when he hates the story that he's adapting, you can also tell. Yes. The last time that I read Arc of Infinity. This is a guy who co-created the Time Lords. This is a guy who co-created Gallifrey. And you could just tell from the way he writes his prose and takes his pot shots that he didn't understand what the story was trying to do. And he was just going to go down swinging, making fun of it as he was adapting it. No. So it's almost Terrence doing a hate watch. And yet his prose is so good. And yeah. when he's adding character, like talking about how tolerant the people of Amsterdam are, it's just yeah. Terrence on point. Oh, Even yeah. when he's only writing a 95-page book, he gets in enough uh, jabs or funny asides to make the book just seem a lot longer than it is. I like the way that Terrence kind of explains things. Uh, I've always loved the way Terrence explains things. He does this in Planet of the Spiders, too. But uh, in, in, in Arc of Infinity, there's this wonderful uh, moment where they, he explains why the people, the crowds in Amsterdam are unperturbed by the sight of the police box. And he says, well, you know, it's part of, you know, a, a British tourism display, much like bringing a Rootmaster bus through or something, <laughs> a double-decker bus. <laughs> and, you know, I and, I thought, and I thought, uh, and and, I, and that's always stayed with me because I just thought because and I remember I recently rewatched uh, I rewatched uh, Arkham Infinity and I just thought to myself no I don't th- I really don't think the the Dutch crowds were were uh, were uh, unperturbed because they because they just assumed it was a British tourism. <laughs> <laughs> somehow but it it made sense when you were reading the book it just sort of made you just kind of breeze to breeze through it so yeah i love that about terrence's stuff what's funny about the three doctors it's the book that comes out next in publication order right after planet of the spiders so mm-hmm. my faithful listeners who are going to tune in next sunday will hear me talk about the three doctors with a different guest what struck me back in 2017 when i was reading those books in order for the blog version of this podcast is how much deeper planet of the spiders is as a book it's only about 10 pages longer maybe but mm-hmm. it's got smaller print so i'd assume it has a higher word count probably planet begins with this very evocative introduction none of which appears on tv at all terence just made it up out of whole cloth there's the whole scene with professor cliff jones uh, rest in peace to Stuart bevan who passed away about three days ago as we record this and josephine jones who was the former joe grant it's terence almost writing a love letter to the era that he was co-creating mm. as he's writing the book a few months into the tom baker era when you first read Planet of the Spiders, did you know that opening was invented out of whole cloth? And how did it grab you? It, it probably grabbed me. I, I hadn't actually seen any of the per- we when I first watched when I first read Planet of the Spiders. That's the thing about it is that, and that's I think the thing I wanted to talk about most was that was that I hadn't read, I hadn't watched a single a single bit of footage of. Pertwee. I read Plan of the Spiders, and I do remember when I read it. Uh, I read it in November 1984. And the reason why I remember it was ni- November 1984 was that I had a gigantic crush on 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 my English teacher in high school, and uh, and and she asked me if I would be her secretary on the parent night when the parents come in to go do the you know go be you know talk with the teachers about their their students, and and so. And so, but they had to have each, 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 each uh, student had a, each teacher had a, uh, a student act as a secretary and sort of, you know, keep track of the appointments and make sure that people were sitting com- comfortably outside and such. And so I did that. And, and during that, I read Planet of the Spiders, which with the, uh, with the second edition cover with the, with the metabolic 
crystal and and the, and the spider on the cover, not the one where you see the doctor's face regenerate. I and so I remember that. Um, I didn't watch my first episode of Pertwee until uh, the week of Christmas, nineteen eighty four. So I it was about I was about I was about a, two months out from from when I would actually seen my first Pertwee story. So the Joe stuff did not make the impact. Uh, as a result, I sort of it was it added nice context. I remember when I reread the book a couple of years later, I was like, "Oh, I get that now." Um, but but it also did a, a wonderful bit of scene setting and and made it very exciting and big. And you thought, "Oh, you know, you know." So I wasn't disappointed that Joe wasn't in it, but I wasn't. But at the same time, I really loved that she was, um, even though I hadn't actually I hadn't actually you know seen a seen a story with Joe Grant in it by the time I'd read the book. You mentioned that you had a crush on your teacher, and as you're sitting in your home recording studio, I can see a wall of Peanuts Fantagraphic books in the upper right-hand corner of my screen. Yeah. So I need to ask, was your teacher Miss Othmar? No, it was not. Uh, I, uh, but no, I am... Uh... I am very fond, uh, but I am very fond of those strips, though. Um, and boy, to, boy, howdy, did I, I did I identify with Linus? So yeah, uh, most of my life I have identified with Linus, to be honest. So <laughs> see, I am a straight up Charlie Brown. When I was in fifth grade, I lost my school spelling bee. I was one of the two finalists, and I lost the spelling bee when I misspelled the name of the school. Ow. Because I was I was at an elementary school and the word was elementary and it was the most gimme word in the history of gimmies and I spelled it wrong and then I lost the spelling bee on the very next move and of course Charlie Brown famously lost the spelling bee the Nationals when he misspelled the name of his dog so there has never been a more Charlie Brown moment than me misspelling the name of my school for all the glory. Ow! I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So but, you yeah. read. Planet of the Spiders in November 1984, which is an amazing rhyme because I watched my very first Doctor Who on PBS in November 1984, Mm. Time Flight Part 1, and then a week later, Arc of Infinity Part 2, the latter of which, the cliffhanger, is what really hooked me into the show. So our our fandoms almost rhyme in that sense. <laughs> I know that I first got my Planet of the Spiders probably in 1985. At that point, I'd had the program guide, and I hadn't seen the story yet, but I knew that this was the regeneration story, mm. and I was desperate to have it. And I was e- e- even able to survive that horrible pun on the back cover where the brigadier goes, bless my soul, who will be next? That didn't oh, even yes, throw me. Right. That's right. No. So for me, this was a magical book, and I've read it quite a bit over the years. And even though there are some, shall we say, less fondly remembered elements to Barry Letts' direction, which we'll talk about shortly, Mm -hmm. I think even the parts of the book that fail on television work really well in print because you're liberated from some of the acting and directing choices. So I've read Planet of the Spiders probably about every five years as an adult, um, after 1984, when is the next time that you read Planet of the Spiders? I probably read it in the early 90s at some point because I because I because I'd finally gotten a copy of the book um, uh, rather than I, stealing well, Rob's rather than stealing Rob's. So I finally read. So I finally had my own copy. And I, I remember because I remember rereading the the uh, the prologue and going, oh, yeah, that is kind of cool. Um, I. And then I did not read it again until until uh, in preparation for this. So this has been a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting journey on memory lane. I had very fond memories of this book. Um, I, I, I when I met Terrence Dix in uh, in uh, 2000, I I brought like six books for him to autograph. And 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 I brought and Planet of the Spiders was one of them. And it was it was kind of a it was I'd forgotten that I'd done it when I until I opened it up and saw to Graham best wishes Terrence Dix. So it was it was so yeah, I have I had tremendous fondness for this book. And I had fondness for this book for I think I'm probably going to jump on your next question. Um, but I I think I, my fondness for the book was um it's probably the only time in my life um as a doctor who fan where i had that thing that everyone has ever read a target novels claim to have had where they go oh my god it was just so much better in the book and and for the most part i did never had that issue like i i mean you know, you know like i i remember you know reading all kinds of target novels way before i before before uh 
before the shows ever came out because either the episodes were missing, they weren't being broadcast, or because I was, you know, stuck waiting for, you know, when when PBS would finally show would finally show me Caves of Androsani. So there was all kinds of, you know, all kinds of reasons. And so I read most of my target novels long before I'd actually seen the seen the episode. But Planet of the Spiders, for some reason, it just really felt um so much bigger and 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 broader and more epic and uh there's all kinds of things in it that um that i i remember the one thing that always stuck with me vividly was the bits on metabolus 3 particularly when the doctor is when the doctor is blasted by the spider and 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 has to get and sarah has to sneak to the tardis in the middle of the night and, and get out the machine and 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 all that stuff felt very very kind of serious and epic and filmic uh reading it in the book and i remember being so disappointed when i finally got to see the you know the sets which are all green screen and 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 very very kind of it's very uh it's very very it's really cheap even by doctor who's standards it's really cheap and i remember being and and the acting is and the acting is uh, you know let's just be generous and say it 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 it, it you know, it makes, it makes the twin dilemma look good. So, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so, you know, I just felt like, I just felt like there was, there was some, there was some, you know, I just felt it was very, you know, like I just felt, I felt like there was something real in Planet of the Spiders and there wasn't in the actual, in the actual thing. That, that's certainly what I thought as, as a 14 year old um, when I, when I, when, so that's why this book had its fondness for me. Now, did I stay with that? Well, we'll come back to that later, but, um, but I am, but yeah, that was kind of how I, I, I approached it. You know, that scene where Sarah gets the machine, which, drains the bad energy out of the doctor and is then used to determine which gemstones have anti-psychic yeah. powers. Growing up as I did in a house that had survived barely the 1970s, if you ever see the photo of me holding my Vinnie Barbarino guitar on my fourth birthday, standing on burnt orange shag carpeting in front of a Jackson Pollock couch, you'll know how barely my household survived the 1970s. So we had the ultimate. This is before the dustbuster. We had the ultimate in 1970s decor. It was a gray hand vacuum cleaner. Yep. It was a big gray box with red buttons, red switches, not even buttons. And there was a long hose uh, with a little filter attachment at the end, and that was your hand vacuum cleaner. When we got our dustbuster, that just sat on the back of the closet unloved. But that was my when I was reading. Planet of the Spiders, if I was home alone, I would act the book out, and I would grab that 70s gray hand vac <laughs> to play that scene. So I was Sarah Jane using that hand vac to suck the bad spider vibes out of the doctor. <laughs> See, I, I mean, I loved all that bit. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, when you're reading it for the first time, you know, it's dark out. It's it's stormy. You have this sort of vista in your head that's, that Terrence constructed with very minimal prose and it's all so terribly exciting and so when you actually sort of see it play out in 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 some of the worst design sets in doctor who history you're it it, it is it is a really grave disappointment like it, it, it you know like you know it just it just i was so kind of like i remember watching that in 1985 because i finally got to see it probably i'd say around march or april 1985 i can never remember the broadcast schedules but it was around that time and i remember going oh okay i guess and i never had, did that for any other target novel like every other target novel is like yeah these are this is just a different thing yes okay the book so it makes it sound more grander in the book but yes that no this is what this is the, what the real thing was i was i i, I remember reading i remember watching those scenes of metabolus and going couldn't we get what we had in the book that was cool <laughs> So let me ask you about another part of the story that is less fondly remembered. Episode 2, the last 10 or 12 minutes of Episode oh, yeah. 2 is the last grand multi-scene, mm -hmm. multi-set, multi-vehicle, John Pertwee, James Bond-style chase sequence where you go from Bessie to the gyrocopter to the Humobile to the hovercraft to the speedboat. I have a fondness for that scene more than I do for the corresponding 12 minute long chase scene in Invasion of the Dinosaurs mm -hmm. Episode 5, which is coming up on this show in a, in a month or so. 
I happen to like that chase scene because I have great fondness for Planet of the Spiders, even in spite of some of Barry Letts' design and direction flaws. Mm. When I read that material in the book, I thought Terrence did a great job of bouncing the POV from character to character as much as the Doctor changes vehicles because he gets into the head of the police officer who's yeah. involved in the chase and he has Sarah's reaction as the Humabile starts flying. Terrence really enjoyed, I think, adapting that chase scene. Did the chase scene work for you in the book, especially reading it back just now this week in preparation for this recording? It did, but what what I would point out is that he it's a very super fast gloss over of that scene. Like, you know, this does not take, this is, does not take the equivalent of <laughs> number of pages as this whole second half of an, of an episode. Like he literally gets, does that, that chase sequence in a page and it's, 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 it captures all the nuances of it. Does it really well by doing the multiple points of view, as you say. And, and it, but it's, 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 bang 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 and he's he's through it and he's done and it's it's very kind of super condensed and and i and i and i I kind of liked it for that reason because i think he i think he knew that you know it was fun as hell to watch on television i love that scene too um there's so much to i mean i mean it 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 is a gigantically self-indulgent thing to do for the sake of an actor who cares? It's a lot of fun to watch. Um, and the Whomobile <laughs> flies. And so, you know, um, I what I love uh, is that the point of views start even in the opening scene of that whole sequence where you have the point of view of the unit officer who takes great pride in, in cleaning the doctor's car. Uh, oh, yes, which, I, yes. which I thought was adorable. Um, and, 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 and even, and Terrence being Terrence, he pauses for a moment to explain why Lupton could just wander on to a unit base and not get not. And, and it's like, well, yeah, of course you could, because, you know, everyone sort of knew that it was a broadly a military base, but you know, if you're outside, it was fine. And, and it's only when you get inside that you have to need passes and everything. And I thought, well, that's just classic Terrence, you know, let's, let's talk about, you know, how can like, this guy just blithely walk up? Um, so yeah, no, it, I mean, it sets it up really well. Um, and the scene, but it, it's, 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 it's a very lean thing. Like he, he's, he's more concerned with other things. I mean, the other thing I love, it, the opposite thing happens uh when he's doing the whole lead up to the end of episode uh well when he's leading up to the uh to the 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 illusion of the tractor that's that you know, to drive uh, to drive them off the road and towards the end of episode one when the spider first appears both those things he really elaborates on them and he and he and he sort of builds it up and makes it much more epic than it actually is in the tv version and so so he so he's obviously sort of figuring out well I can I can cut down I can cut down that ridiculous chase scene to a, to a tight to a tight one page, but I can expand the end of episode one to something that's actually really scary. So yeah, I one day should do a supercut of all the times where Terrence uses one perfectly crafted sentence to explain away gaping plot holes, like in <laughs> Warriors in Warriors of the Deep. Fortunately, Buluk knew how to navigate sea bases ventilation shafts to get from point A to point B. <laughs> I mean, there's just no way that anybody is going to know that. And of course, Terrence goes, fortunately, he knew his way around. Yeah, Boom. Exactly. Plot, hopes, plot hole solved. Exactly. Exactly. And it, Terrence always does that. I mean, he's, he's always thinking, he's always thinking on his feet, like, you know, what is the reader who is going to be mostly juvenile, who's going to be mostly a doctor, an obsessive Doctor Who fan? You know, what are they thinking about? And let me try, let me, let me try and address that. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I wanted to point out, I wanted to go back to just a second to talk about the way that he sort of extended it. Like the lovely bit of, pro- it's, it's it's an amazing bit of prose because you have the, like all these redolent little ch- moments where he, where he does the intercutting, but he does the intercutting in such an interesting way. Like he he has like these long, these long passage about Mike Yates driving the sports car. And then all of a sudden it cuts to like in brackets, he has in the cellar of the monastery, the circle of chanting figures was once more assembled. Their voices rose and fell in guttural chant. And then all of a sudden he cuts back to, you know, Sarah frowned and shook her head. And it's like, so it's, it's, he, he really nicely kind of captures the inner cutting, probably even better than it was done in, in the show. Um, and, and it's just, it's just, again, economy of prose and just knowing how to, how to, how to punch it. There has been a phenomenon in real life. It's called the Mandela effect. 
but in Doctor Who fans, it's where you vividly remember having seen a scene on television, and then you go back to watch the show again 20 years later on the Blu-ray, and the scene is not there. And it turns out it was only ever in the book, but you thought it had been on TV the whole time because yeah. Terrence's books are so vivid. Were there any Mandela effect moments for you the last time you watched Planet of the Spiders that you were convinced should have been on TV, but in fact were really just a memory from the book? No, actually, no. no. I mean, that's happened for me with a couple of other, with a couple other Target novels, particularly, particularly, uh, particularly for, uh, um, particularly for Colin Baker's Doctor. I've been doing a rewatch of Colin Baker's Doctor, and I'm going, "What? Why isn't there?" That's oh, that's right. That's that's actually in the novelization. Okay, so I didn't really ha- ever have that happen with uh, with uh, with this one though. Um, you know, for the most part, I just had that sort of effect of, "Oh, this is this is much more. This is much more." <laughs> disappointing um in 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 the actual realization than i than i than i'd remembered it being um and every and i have to say it still hurts every time i watch a metabolist 3 scene so not to flog that thing any further but and the funny thing is is that the spiders i'm perfectly cool with maybe because i'd seen a bit of planet of the spiders when i was five but but i but i was I was cool with the spiders. The spiders are like fine, you know. It's the best you can do back in back in 1974. I yeah, it was it was it was it was for me. Yeah, it was just for me. All the Metabola stuff. The spiders have great voices. You know, you have especially Kismet yeah. Delgado in there, and the great one is just having an incredible time in the recording booth. And Terence tries to capture that by writing the great ones in all capital letters. Yep. And her final rant before her brain explodes, he writes it almost as poetry rather than um, yeah. Yeah. in straight lines of dialogue. So you've read Planet of the Spiders probably, let's say, three times. You read it at age yeah. 14. Yeah. You read it again in your early 20s. Yeah. And then flash forward 30 years, you're reading it now in your late 30s here in the year 2022. Did the book change for you did your perception of the book change did it improve did it seem not quite as good as you remembered how has the passage of time affected your enjoyment of the novelization my reread of in the, in the 90s was reasonably pleasant i seem to recall i don't re- have a, have any real standout memories other than the prologue um between the the initial read and now i had the oh the first half of the novel I love the first half of the novel, you know, you know, 2022 me loved uh, everything was being done. That passage I just read uh, is, is amazing. There's a lot of great things. Uh, The way he sort of condenses the sort of sillier bits is, is also good. I think rereading it now, I was very, um, it's the second half of the book that I find the most disappointing. He takes out all, he takes out all the emotional beats. Um, which I found very Ooh. frustrating. Like uh, for me, one of the finest scenes in 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 the television story is uh, the scene when Tommy has a sort of flowers for Algernon moment, and the blue crystal kind of makes it, and and Terence Terence compresses it to nothingness, where it's kind of like almost incidental that Tommy has become super intelligent, and 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 it's and I get that you know. To get John John Kane is an amazing actor, and and I think he I think he totally sells that performance in a way that um, no other actor in, and he's he's one of my favorite supporting actors in Doctor Who as a result, and I and I think that he and I think that there was um I think you know maybe trying to recapture that is hard, but I also kind of felt like uh, a more straight up adaptation of that scene could have worked. Um, but he's very kind of he's very kind of matter of fact, and I, I felt that kind of beat through emotional beat the emotional beat that i'm really mad about is that um there oh, there's a lot built about the fact that the third doctor meets faces his fear is that is that is that the 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 great one you know basically makes the doctor completely vulnerable and there's that wonderful bit where Kesson Skeltigato is is that fear i sense doctor <laughs> and 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 i love that and i love that that scene and it was a big enough that that you know Barry let's even fl- did a full quick flashback to it just in case you missed episode 5 here right. it is again in episode 6 just to emphasize just to emphasize how important it is and then you have the doctor saying i had to do it i had to face my fear and that's all completely out of it and i don't know why whether whether terence just felt that it didn't make the doctor seem heroic or he or is just something Barry did that he didn't agree with and he was kind of overruled or or what but it's 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 gone and and the doctors and and this and the whole kind of which i think 
I think diminishes the heroism of, of the third doctor's final act. And I, and I felt really kind of, and, and so I was really, really put out by it because I, because I felt like the first half, I'm like, oh yeah, this is everything I remember. And this is, this is, this is so good. And all the stuff with professor Clegg in this book is so amazing. And he, and he really fleshes Clegg's bit out in, in really great ways. There's just so much in the first half of this book that is so good. And the second half is like, is like, he's, he keeps on just kind of diminishing the bits and even, even, even Campo and Pache's kind of contribution gets kind of sanded off. I feel so. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was, I was, I, I ended up, I started it really excited and, and, and thought I was just, this is going to be a slam dunk. This is, I'm going to be just talking about how great this is and how much better this is in the, in the, than the TV show. And I ended it actually going, actually the TV show actually ends up being a much better, um, it does for the things that it was doing that it was innovating, actually, like it, it basically takes the innovation of planet of the spiders is that it tries to give the doctor a actual emotional journey in it. And, and it also tries to, and it also has kind of emotional journeys for several other characters. And, and that's all kind of, that's all kind of taken out of this. And, and I feel that's, that's kind of, I get why Terrence did that. He probably just wanted a more straight ahead, straight ahead adventure that the kids could read. I, I think it was a mistake. So yeah, I was very disappointed. It's interesting you bring that up because the regeneration scene is condensed into a three-page epilogue. And granted, it's very small print, so it's probably five yeah. or six pages in a later Target book. Yeah. But I don't think I even noticed that you're right. That, that, that bit about having to face my fears more important than going on living. Yeah. It's cut out, and the doctor only has two or three lines in one long paragraph, and, and then he dies. And also, Planet of the Spiders was the end of a trilogy of stories for Mike Yates, going from Green Death yeah. to Invasion of the Dinosaurs to this. And those three books came out of order in the target line. That's right. But it's Mike going from hero to traitor to redemption. And that's also sanded off a little bit for the book, which is surprising given that. Terrence would have been a co-creator of Captain Yates and would have yeah. been there for the planning of that entire story arc. And Mike doesn't really register as much in the book as perhaps Richard Franklin did on television. That's true too. I, I and, and it's interesting, like uh, the things that the Brigadier says to even telegraph that the doctor regenerated before, which is clearly in dialogue in, in the, in the television version is out of here. Like he actually has the Brigadier starting to say that when the TARDIS arrives in, 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 in the, in his rewriting of the final scene. And I, I feel that's kind of a disappointment because I feel like there's, there's so much, there's so much richness of that final scene. It's, it's a, it's a frustrating thing reading uh, final scenes of doctors in the target books, because none of them are frankly as good as what happens on television. Uh, you know, we could we could spend all the night talking about you know the the whole the whole the whole complete wrongness of the Tenth Planet's final scene, but it just but it just kind of kind of goes all the way through. Every single one really. Case of Andrazani's novelization isn't bad, but it's kind of flat. But yeah, Rogopolis doesn't really have Rogopolis gives us an opening line for Davison, but it doesn't really have a. It, it's not as it's not nearly as impactful. Um, yeah, the rest of them aren't either. I think that Terence's handling of the regeneration in Androzani is a million times better than here because he tells the yeah. regeneration from the doctor's point of view. Yeah. He talks about Adric is dead, but then again, so was he. And he yeah. again writes that almost in poetry format with single line sentences. So That's true. I think Caves stands up much better compared to this. Here the regeneration, the doctor's, you know, already dead and it's just, you know, his features blur and change and that's about it. You get a longer regeneration on the original Peter Brooks cover of the novelization with the four it's faces <laughs> than you do in, in the text of the book. I'm going to disagree slightly. Uh, yeah, big shock. Jason and Graham disagree about something. I know, really. Um, I, I read these books when I was you know much younger. I would have read Planet of the Spiders at age 12. There were two times when I was sitting there in English class in high school in the late 1980s when we read a poem for class out loud, and I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I know this from a Terrence Dix novelization. <laughs> and that's twice that I was grabbed by the, oh, wait a minute, Terrence Dix has been teaching me the great, the great English poets. Yeah. The first time is in 10th grade, we're sitting there in Ms. Montalbano's class reading The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner out loud. And I ended up being the student called to read the stanza, like one who on a lonesome road does walk in fear and dread. And I'm halfway through the, it took every ounce of coolness that I don't have to not blurt out, this is from Image of the Fendal! 
Because I can tell you, as sure as eggs is eggs, I was the only person in the class who would have read Image of the Fendal. But I suddenly recognized that bit of poetry that Terence uh, condensed for Image of the Fendal because I'm sitting there out loud in 1989 reading it in English class. The other time that happened to me is when, in a different English class, I forget when, we had to read The Tiger by William That's Blake. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know this from Planet of the Spiders. I have fonder memories, memories I should say, of Tommy's transformation sequence because it has William Blake in there. And because I recognized it in English class a couple of years later. <laughs> it is, it is, I mean, that, that is, that is a nice beat that he puts in it. But yeah, I, I was, I was like, you know, again, it's one of those things where he condenses, he can, he can, he condenses down, you know, he condenses down what's like three or four minutes in the TV version to like, to like far five or six paragraphs. And it's very, it, it, it's, it, it feels like it could have gotten more of its due, I think. Um, although I did like the bit from the tiger, uh, but that was, that was kind of cool. Um, it's almost like Malcolm Hulk syndrome, though, where the first half of the novelization is the first one or two episodes out of six on TV. Yeah. And by the end of it, Terrence has to fairly race yeah. through. I think I think the part six material here starts in the middle of chapter 11. So the part six material is very condensed, a chapter and a half, and then that cursory three-page yeah. epilogue. So for you, what is the definitive Terrence Dix novelization? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm quite fond of the Five Doctors. I have to say, uh, I, I, I mean, I do love, I do, I do love the Auton Invasion a lot. Like, I think the Auton Invasion is head and shoulders uh, one of his finest works, partially because he just thought this was a one-off, and and so I think he put more of himself and more time into into the actual writing of it from probably any other. But honestly, uh, pound for pound, my favorite of his novelizations is is is. Uh, is is uh the five doctors it's it's the sparseness of it i love the opening line i love i love all the I, all, all the story beats are really great he just kind of he 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 manages to he manages to sort of build on the sort of camaraderie of 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 the characters on screen and and sort of and sort of really improve it like the doctor's relationship with sarah on screen is great but but it's really wonderfully rendered in prose uh i really love how i really love his how he even creates or creates the hartnell doctor probably to feel even more like the hartnell doctor than than the richard herndl doctor i think um i i and i love uh and i love particularly his his uh his uh his his the way he renders the uh second doctor uh brigadier relationship um so yeah i have i have a i think i think my my pick for favorite favorite terrence novel is the five doctors and five doctors has the added advantage of the extra scene where you see susan in the 22nd century That's right before she's grabbed up by the time scoop which was never mounted for television so right. how did you get to meet terrence stick you said you met him the one time and had him sign about half a dozen books how, how did yeah. you meet him uh, okay, so uh, yeah, back in 2000, uh, we were all talking about uh, trying to do some kind of a, a convention in Toronto, and uh, and my friend at the time, Mike, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and me and a couple others were all talking about it, and I guess I guess uh, one friend of ours, Eric, I, 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 it's been it's it's been 22 years, so I don't I, I don't remember the quite how the sequence goes. I think Eric talked to Paul Cornell and, and said, well, what about Terrence Dix? And he said, Oh, uh, his phone numbers, his phone numbers listed in the directory. Why don't you just call him? And huh. so our friend, so our friend Mike called him up and said, Hey, would you be willing to come to Toronto for, uh, for, for, uh, for a one day convention and, you know, we'll show you around and, you know, put you up in a hotel. And, and Terrence said, Oh yeah, sure. No problem. That sounds lovely. And so, so he came to Toronto in, in November, 20. Uh, November 2000 and uh, and I was one of the I was one of the convention organizers and at the time I was editing a, a fanzine called Enlightenment uh, and to which so I was I, a contributor briefly that's that's right that's right that's right you were and so I had uh, so yeah I I interviewed Terrence for 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 the my fans fanzine I met him like the day before uh, and and I went to a bar uh pretty much not about a couple couple about a block away from where he was staying and i had about five beers with him and he proceeded to and, and this was the early 2000s when a lot of the stuff that he stories they eventually committed to dvds 
hadn't happened yet. So a lot of these were completely new to me. So like I was getting stories about, you know, uh, how John Pertwee and, and Patrick Troughton didn't get on during the, during the five, three doctors and which I didn't know about. And so it was like, Oh my God, this is incredible stuff. Um, and, but yeah. And then I went and then I went out with him and, uh, a bunch of us went out for, uh, for a contributors party. And, and then we went to the, did the convention then after the convention i hung out with them a lot i don't know how i, I i'm convinced i lost about 30 percent of my liquor my liver that weekend um, because <laughs> because because all i did was drink with with with, with terrence Dix, and that man was a prodigious drinker um and uh, and and he just he just knew how to have a good time like he was just one of those he was an amazing raconteur he had a tremendous sense of humor about things he always had a great story about uh, about about things not even just doctor who you could talk to him about anything and he would just he would just have he, would, he was one of the all-time best raconteurs it was one of the finest weekends of my life and it's so funny about a year ago i was here it was just after i'd I'd uh, put up the bookshelf and put up the, put up my target books. And I, I, we were, I think I was talking on someone on Facebook about, about books turned that we had autographed by actors. And I, and I bought off eBay a first edition copy of Dr. Who and the Auto Invasion that had been already autographed by, by John Pertwee. Um, and, uh, it cost me an obscene amount of money and this is an obscene amount of 1999 money. Ooh. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was, I, 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 it was one of those auctions that I was like, Oh my God, I did. And I was like, and I'm not going to be eating food for the next two weeks. Okay. So yeah, it was, it was, it was not one of my better moments, but on the other hand, I got a cool novelization and I subsequently had Terrence novel uh, autograph and I had uh, Nick Courtney no autograph it. So one day I'll put it on eBay and I'll make a, I'll make a 10th of what I spent it, I spent on it back in <laughs> 1999 because no one cares about these things anymore, but nonetheless, it's very cool. So I got, I wanted to go sh show a, 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 a a photograph of the page on, on my uh, on this Facebook group, web group, and I opened it up, and there was a photo of me and Terrence uh, from that from that weekend. And I oh was wow! Like, I was like, oh my god! And it was just about a year after he died. So yeah, it was it was it was a uh, yeah, it was a lovely it was a lovely moment. And uh, I actually have a, a one other Terrence Dick story, which I've actually never I actually I have never I, I was supposed to put on Reality Mom, I never did. So you guys, you're getting an exclusive here, uh, Jason. Um, Thank you. So so back in. 1985 i had there were two doctor who fans i knew in the world one was my best friend rob and the other was this guy named bob i did a i did an editorial about this guy about this guy named bob uh he was a he was a he was a he was a classmate he was big into doctor who fandom he he was really connected he went to conventions he he did all kinds of things he, he he just was really you know and then one day he just suddenly stopped being a fan i was like what the fuck and so yeah he was very it was very strange uh but anyway so while he was a fan he he had the idea that he wanted to make a fan video well okay and so i so he asked me if i'd want to write a script for it. i said sure so i i wrote a parody it was called doctor who and the attack of the garbage man and the, <laughs> plot, and the plot of the doctor who and the attack of the garbage man is that the doctor and his companion ramona are uh have landed in 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 coronation park in oakville where i grew up in oakville ontario uh and uh and they're menaced by walking garbage coming from emerging from lake ontario um so it's people it's people dressed in garbage bags emerging from lake ontario and it's 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 animated garbage and it turns out to be a plot by the uh the master's earliest no incarnation the novice uh <laughs> yeah 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 i engaged in that little thing we actually have one por portion that was was actually meant to be uh exposition delivered by a singing mountie we 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 pulled out all the stops for this thing, um, and we actually cast it. I was going to play the doctor. My sister was going to play the, Ramona. My uh, my friend Rob was going to play play the novice. My friend my friend my under, I had another friend named Bob, and he was going to be the singing mountie. It was it was really funny, um, and then for some reason because we're all teenagers it didn't happen uh, i i don't actually really remember the reasons but i think we i think i think it just bob didn't bob didn't want to do it all of a sudden or something and anyways got pulled but anyways at some point uh during the lead up for all that bob took this print out of the script he was working at a convention in i think it was rochester it was either rochester or niagara falls i can't remember which one now um, and, and it was a con that I think Janet Fielding was at, JNT was at, and Terrence was at. 
And so he was working as a as one of those porters or runners that they, you know, used to have, you know, guest liaison used to have. And so he got to talk with Terrence a little bit. And I guess he gave Terrence a copy of the script. And so Terrence, Terrence went away and, and, and then he gave it back to Bob w- with a note on it and it said, oh my. it said, this is really sharp and funny and made me laugh. And he inserted it out loud several times. Great, <laughs> great jokes and a good ecological point. All the best Terrence sticks. Wow. And, and, I, and I was like, how on earth? And I asked him like years later, do you remember reading this? He's of course not. And I thought, yeah, I figured. <laughs> but, but you have to think about this. Like this is a guy who is in the middle of a convention and, and you just came home from a convention and you know what a whirlwind of, of experiences that thing is where you're constantly moving from one place to another. And when you're a guest, you're constantly getting shuttled to, from one place to another, to another, to another, and, and then having either talk or autograph or, or whatever how he found the time to go read that little skit and then write that note is astounding to me. Like he was just that kind uh, of person and he was that kind period. So yeah, no, that was, it was a, it was a lovely moment. So when you were sitting there and if you're going to lose 30% of your liver, losing it to Terrence Dix is certainly the way to go. I've always but- felt that. <laughs> Did he, at any point in that conversation, telling stories about the 1970s, use the word bouffant? He did not, sadly. <sighs> so, sadly. Sadly. I did ask him about his prose style, though. And, and he did, and I remember he said he was a big fan, and I don't think he's ever said that in any other interview, but he said to me he was a big fan of George Simeonson, who wrote the McRae novels. Oh, and wow. he was a big fan, he was a big fan of Magray. And and so I think he and so he emulated that. Now people always connected him with Marlowe. Um and and there is a there's a lot of Philip Marlowe and uh, in 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 and in his work, but yeah, he uh but yeah, uh George Simeonson is also another big influence on him apparently. Um so yeah. I always enjoy when you can spot a quote from another author inside a novelization the way Terrence dropped some Shakespeare on the last page of Ambassadors of Death talking about Band of Brothers. <laughs> and there's a few other examples of that over the, of that over the years. But um, I'm looking for uh, to try a new segment on uh, Doctor Who literature, and I'm going to have you be our first subject. Okay. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to cut it out of the recording, and if it does work, okay. it'll become a weekly feature. Okay. This is Doctor Who 20 Questions. Okay. I have gone to what I believe is called randomizer.net, and I have picked one random Doctor Who story out of the entire run, 1963 okay. to 2022. Okay. And you are going to guess which story was randomly selected by 20 questions. You can ask me 20 questions, yes or no, and we'll see if you can narrow down what story have been, okay. has been randomly selected. Okay. All right. Sure. I'll give it a whirl. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's see if the second one's going to work. Okay. Question is one. A- is it a classic series story or a, or a modern series story? It got to be a yes or no question. Classic series story. No, it is not. Okay. Uh, question two. Russell Davies era story. No. Question three. Moffat era story. Ooh, good guesses. Uh, no. Question four. Chibnall era story. Yes. Question five. Series 12. Yes, it is a Series 12 story. Okay. Question 6. Is it a New Year's special? Yes, it is. Question 7. Does it have multiple Daleks in it? No, it does not. Is it Revolution? Res- res- resolution. Resolution. Is it Resolution? Yes, it is Resolution. Okay. <laughs> All right, that was good. You got an eight. You see, you had a very methodical, very methodical way of going era by era, season by season. So you got to it in a hurry. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, so uh, Graham, I want to thank you very much. Before I let you go, where else can our viewers or listeners, I should say, find you in the podcasts, in the books, on the internet? 
Uh, okay, well, uh, the books I have done are uh, are the books with uh, Stacy Smith, uh, and they are Who is the Doctor and Who is the Doctor 2, which was published last year. Uh, no, published in 2020. I keep on forgetting. We're sort of, we're sort of in year two of, of 2020, so I just kind of... I, it, it, <laughs> yes. It all kind of... So, yeah, we, we last published our last book together in 2020. Uh, it was Who is the Doctor 2. We've done a couple others. Who's 50? Uh, who the Doctors are in. Uh, several others. So you can find me in print there. Um, they, they're all available on the various forms of Amazon. I appear frequently in Stacy Smith's Outside In collection. I have one in the her upcoming uh, Twin Peaks uh, collection, and I will be reviewing Pyramids of Mars in their in their new uh, in their new Doctor Who collection, which I owe Stacy an article. Sorry, and <laughs> <laughs> Stacy used to me being profoundly late with these things. Uh, on 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 the air, you can follow. You can listen to me on Reality Bomb, which is a podcast I co-host with. Uh, Joy Piedmont, and uh, that can be found at uh, realitybombpodcast.com and uh, anywhere you get your fine your fine Doctor Who podcasts, uh, you can get this one. It's a it's a monthly uh, it's a monthly magazine show that sort of tries to resemble a good NPR uh, when I can. Uh, Hence my comparison to Terry to uh, Terry Gross earlier. Oh, oh, that's kind of you. And uh, otherwise, uh, I'm on Twitter. I, my my Twitter handle is at Graham Burke, so uh, G R A E M E B U R K. Uh, and uh, I yeah, I'm trying to think what else you can find me. Uh, I think it's been announced. I think it was announced at Gallifrey. I, I, if I'm not, well, guess guess your listeners get another exclusive scoop. I am currently working on a biography of Doctor Who producer uh, and legend Ter- Philip Hinchcliffe. Uh, that was if it was announced, I was not in the room, so that is news to me. Thank you. Yes, um, yes, it's. Uh, I, I'm currently working on that for uh, for uh, cut away, the pe- good find people at Cutaway Comics, um, and, uh, and they're 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 doing a. A, uh, a a a print uh, a print branch and I will be and I will be doing uh, I think their first book for that and so I'm sure there'll be news on their on their site about it soon uh, I'm currently and still in the process of, of doing the research for it but it's good but it's an authorized biography I've been interviewing Philip Hinchcliffe all last summer that's uh, that's that's a, I call that a good day uh, and I... that is a wonderful way to pass the time indeed indeed so that that's been a lot of fun and uh yeah i'm hoping to go go to do the bbc archives this uh this uh later this summer and uh and do some further research for it and uh yeah i got to talk to louise jameson last week that was that was kind of cool um so yeah so no i guess it's it's so i'm doing the the doctor who nerd living the dream very exciting the episode of Reality Bomb that is a tribute to Terrence Sticks is episode 072. Uh, my slim vocal talents also appear performing a bit of the novelization of The Power of Kroll, of all things. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes, as well as some of your books. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, yeah. No, yeah, you're, you're really... Uh, Jason is underselling himself. Jason was one of the guests in our tribute to Terrence Dix, and uh, he was sort of... He sort of, he sort of was, uh, was, an, uh, was, a, was an anchor for that. I, it was really great to be able to talk to him, and, and he manages to make lots of really great self-deprecating jokes along the way, um, but it has some wonderful insights about Terrence in it, too. Thank you. Well, Graham, thank you very much for joining us here on Doctor Who Literature. Hope to have you back again real soon now. Have a great night. Thanks very much. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. Next time... Omega. Don't forget Omega, as if you could. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. Special thanks to my special guest, Graham Burke. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor and can also be found on Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels. And you can also find me on the Trap One podcast from time to time. I write about Doctor Who on Twitter using the hashtag DRWhoPilgrimage. That's DRWhoPilgrimage. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. 
Next time we'll be discussing Doctor Who and the Three Doctors from November 1975. It's the end of the Target Line's second very successful year, and we'll again be joined by a very special guest, who's back for a second appearance on Doctor Who Literature. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Thank you.